Hello everyone! We are here to talk today about an anime movie called Metropolis, not the silent movie called Metropolis. Uh, this is the 2001 anime film directed by Rintaro and written by Katsuhiro Otomo, although I suspect Otomo's involvement was far more than just the writing. Um, mm. And I kind of want to start there. Uh, Metropolis is a let's just say visually dense film um i think one of the first things you notice about metropolis is just how much it is throwing at you visually both in terms of those backgrounds and also the the frame rate of the drawings uh there are a lot of scenes in here that are clearly drawn on ones uh one drawing per frame and um it has that kind of akira-esque opulence to its animation and, and its artwork uh, and it's one of the things that makes it feel rather different than the original Metropolis is this sort of, um, uh, this, uh, this richness to it. Uh, obviously the original Metropolis is very art deco, it's very complex and so forth. Um, but it feels like this is just kind of overwhelming the sentence, the senses with action sequences and so forth. Um, uh, now had, have you guys seen the original Metropolis? Yes. Yes. Okay. Which doesn't matter that much. <laughs> <laughs> to understand this movie, in fairness. Well, but I mean, it, as I was talking to Steve mm. a little bit before we before we got going, is it tracks you know the the original um, mm. Fritz Lang film mm. you know very very well the overworld the underworld and all the sort of sequence and and stuff in between, mm -hmm. so it does a fine job to have seen both. It doesn't yeah. detract or essentially right. add too much, really. Mm -hmm. So, have either of you read the original manga? Not the manga, um, but I did read the serialized uh, story from okay. the original movie. Not the manga. I thought, didn't Fritz Long's wife write the uh, screenplay for Metropolis? Yeah. Yes, and then she wrote that serialized version of that. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. Reading the original Great Metropolis um, <clears throat> manga um, is not something you need to do either to understand what's going on there. Um, right. There are there is not much in the way of similarities um, because you have all sorts of odd moments in this manga. Um, moments like, let's see if I can find it here. Um, that's not it. Um, yeah, uh, moments like this. Um, this is actually the original Metropolis manga. Uh, it's weird. Uh, there's. So they stole Mickey Mouse? <laughs> <laughs> um, he finds a costume. Basically a... Uh, uh, um, a disguise. A disguise, yes. This is a disguise that he's, uh, he's, he's going in. Which leads and to it just happens to be a copyright violation for him. <laughs> a bizarre moment of, you know, dozens of Mickey oh. Mouses all running at you. Um, oh, goodness. Yes, but, I mean... Wow. So apparently, according to, I think, Rintaro... Uh, Tezuka based the entire manga on the poster for Metropolis. He didn't actually watch the movie. Right. Yeah, that's, that's what you had said. <laughs> yeah. So um, there are bits But I mean, obviously, the way, the way it turned out, at least, you know, as far as the anime is concerned, mm -hmm. I don't know how, you know, I'm assuming the manga has some of the same elements the anime does, right? Uh, so it has Duke Red. But, uh, they it, did. Mm hmm. You know what I mean? But it's so it so it tracks. So it could I, I can't imagine just the poster alone. There had to have been some research to have gotten some basic elements, but maybe not the whole story. Not really? really? <laughs> um, it's no. it's no, not the manga. I, yeah. I... So that's yeah. interesting. Okay, it's it's the kid. So the 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 investigator in Metropolis. There's Duke Red. Um, uh, Fifi is in it. Um, although it doesn't really look like the Fifi. Okay. Album. Uh, that's about it. There are little bits and pieces. Otherwise, wow. there's no Tima. There's no. There's a girl, but she's not that. Um, yeah. There. Interesting. Is a so whole it, it tracks thing. the the anime tracks the film better than the manga tracks the yeah, film exactly. and the anime. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. And when they did, when Otomo did the, the did the character designs or the, the characters, he kind of recycled some from the manga, but. Mm -hmm. The, the manga itself, just like Brenton saying, is from a poster. Uh, the anime is, is from the is from the manga, really, but it does track, um, as you say, the, the, the film. film yeah. Better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, and that's one of the things I want to kind of get into is how, and we were talking about this before, that 
you know, the, the Fritz Lang film is very much a product of its time. It is very much speaking about, you know, industrialism and uh, communism versus capitalism and all those, all these various aspects of, of, mm. of questions at the time. Um, and reaches a rather remarkable ending with that by saying that there needs, that in a sense, you need to have both. You know, that it, it's the, the uh, what is it, the, mm. uh, the, the mind and the heart have to work, and the mind and the hands have to work through the heart, right? Um, whereas this is a very different film from that. Um, it is much more about technology and the, uh, the uh, increasing discomfort with where technology is leading us as human beings, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, which, you know, was the, in, at least in the anime, it's the direct pipeline to fascism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know well, the, the the god seat uh, uh, to not spoil anything for anybody but the the god seat for tima is the control of everyone mm -hmm. that, yeah you know? it's a good rock. well and uh you know you also see it's one of the things i, I love about um uh, these sorts of creators is that it 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 leads to all sorts of things you know it leads to a a coup which is not really related to anything at all. It is just raw, naked power. You know, it is an opportunity for somebody to take over. Uh, and you get that lovely moment, this terrible moment, of uh, of the coup and all of that superimposed imagery of war over that. Yep, right. Um, yeah. I've just seen you know, it's, it's the cycle, right? Just repeating itself. Oh, here we go again. Well, it's the general in the, in the background who is just the reason – for his involvement is, is that is you see the smile on his face as the images of war is going on because he doesn't want to be in a society that's passive. He yep. he wants yeah. war. He wanted that war. He wanted that uprising to happen, and he was willing to you know help yeah. <laughs> actually that happen. And, it's, and yeah, uh, help, it was, help help the president have a wonderful breakfast. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and it's, it's in my opinion, it's really the first shocking moment of the film. Yeah, I think when you start watching Metropolis and you see these images of the whole big city and how lavish it is, and you see the robots and how they're mistreated, I think you can pretty quickly get an idea of where the film is going. Um, some of the some of the reviews of Metropolis have said that the, the plot is um, not too surprising, and I, I would agree with that. You know, the development of the plot kind of kind of yeah. you know go where you expect them to go but it's that betrayal that is not in the film not in the manga um yeah. that is definitely very much about politics <clears throat> and it's about uh you know people in power and what, what that can do yeah. um it's i think one of the really fascinating things is that the manga is more of an adventure story uh with these sort of things kind of as incidental things you know duke red is is, is ruling metropolis fine uh but this is much more a a meditation on uh, power and man's hubris therein. Um, well, I, I thought it was interesting with the general over, you know, commits to the coup and the, the war scenery is how, mm -hmm. you know, that's a civilian government being hijacked by a military authority. Yep. Seems oddly <laughs> familiar, <laughs> doesn't it? Familiar. <laughs> Not you know, not as 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 much you know, murdery assassinations, but there were officers that shot uh, civilian government representatives mm -hmm. prior to World War II. Mm -hmm. There were there were some assassinations of note prior to the outbreak of hostilities. Yeah, so um, it's, it's an interesting. Well, and you, then you get the other side where you get the revolution, um, which I think for a lot of other for a lot of other filmmakers would be, would be pre presented as the side of right. You know, the, this is the right thing to do. And yet, like, their first act of violence is to kill the robot detective oh. yep. that you've come to, to love so much. And and again, I, I love that moment. And it's one of the it's it's another surprising moment in the film, although you can kind of see it coming uh, when Atlas faces off against um, uh, against him and it delivers this speech. And you get this classic Rintaro moment of. Uh, of Atlas in this classic revolutionary pose, just holding on him, arm raised, the revolution, you know, se seizing forward or surging forward, but it's been completely flipped in your mind. You know, you are holding onto that image, but you realize, oh, this is a tainted revolution from the start. Right. 
Well, I mean, ultimately, there isn't the message that violence is sort of ambiguous. Mm-hmm. It, it's not good. It's not bad. You you have some ideals and some issues that are involved in it, but really, violence just begets violence. Yeah, exactly. Um... And, and if you ever notice that in this movie, that it's really somebody has to be on the bottom, and mm-hmm. who's on the bottom? It's the rope. Yep. And so it's you know on the on the one hand you have the 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 Duke Red, the, the president and all that, and all them basically, okay, they're our servants class. They're not human. They're whatever. And rocks view of them as almost racial hatred of just mm-hmm. like, you know, just why are they even here? Then you have the revolutionaries who are saying, you know, treat us better, treat us better. We need, you know, to be treated like human beings, but at the same time, they don't treat the robots well at all. And they go and even one of his Atlas's flunkies, even, is somewhat violent towards robots um, yeah. during the, the one who's bald. And if you notice that our heroes, the inspector and his nephew, what do they call the robot? They call oh. him a dog's name. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, call him what would they call him? Um, Pero, I think. Pero, that's right. Pero. Just yeah. dog. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they have some empathy for the robot, but the best that they can do is go, Oh, you're like a cute pet. Mm-hmm. Good pet, Yeah. You know. um, That's the best they can do. Which is why I think, you know, uh, Tima's turn at the end, which I think I, in, a, in, a, in a Hollywood movie would feel like, okay, that is beat number 23, right? Like we have to have that. <laughs> right. Um, feels very earned. You know, we've seen that come in and you can absolutely see somebody who has watched all of this happen and now has this power say, all right, enough you know you all were wrong <laughs> this is our revenge <laughs> um and it's one of the interesting things about the film is i think it is um is you can absolutely see it as this question about technology right like what um at what point have we come to rely on technology so much that it can come back and bite us in the butt basically um i would argue however that there is a whole nother level to which you could look at this movie. And I want to get your guys' opinion on this. Uh, there is an element of this film that is unique to it. It doesn't show up anywhere else. And it's that little red radio. Right, the team of hits and it starts yeah, playing. playing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I loved the soundtrack to this film. By oh, the way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that. You know, it was it was beautifully done. So. Oh, <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, yeah. That little transistor radio looks remarkably like those early transistor radios that Japan produced that took over the world and started Japan's ascendancy into, you know, technological domination of the world. You could see this film as being about Japan's modernization, Japan's acceleration into the modern world and into excess. This film was made about a decade after the bust of the boom economy, the bubble economy, where all of that had sort of fallen apart. Right. And you could see this as saying, yeah, we all just drunk the Kool-Aid on, you know, industrialization and on becoming this, you know, modern world power. And, you know, it's, it's gotten us very far, no question, but, you know, at what cost, basically. Well, at the revolutionary, you know, at one point they're sitting there talking and the guy's saying, you know, we have no jobs and the little bit of, of pittance that we get from the from the metropolis is going to go away once this great plan gets launched. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't remember what the thing was. The God Seat's got a name. I don't <laughs> remember what it was. Ziggurat. It, yeah. was, is that the translation? Because it was like, it wasn't like Glupnir or something. It was some weird name that they gave for the project that was going to launch. Mm. Oh, and yeah, yeah. they're their recognition, you know, as a revolutionary is like, once that happens, we're redundant Mm -hmm. and that's it. We're not, we're not, we'll be swept off because we're not, we won't get any assistance. We won't get any acknowledgement. We won't get anything. We'll be, we'll be done. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's the great. And, and hence the, the violence towards robots is, you know, that's what happens when you have a, a underclass struggle is those who are at the bottom doing the most menial jobs, displace others and those people get kind of you know crazy mm-hmm. and and legitimately upset and if nobody's there 
to sort of navigate everybody through it together and uses that to pit people against each other to maintain their own power. Welcome to revolution. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Um, And it's one of the reasons why I think the film, you know, which is already 20 years old, still holds up so well um, because it is talking about timeless themes. Um, right. You know, and you can t- definitely interpret it in a lot of different ways. That music. Let's let's talk. Let's. Mm, oh man, that music. <laughs> Dang. Um, oh. Yeah, they had a good ear for for jazz on that whole thing, mm. man. I was just oh. like, wow. <laughs> it, it's yeah. I was telling Brent, I I am surprised I actually don't own this soundtrack mm. uh, because it's it's so good and it's something that's that that is up my alley. That's that that I would listen normally listen to. Yeah. And the, the different iterations that is just thrummed into your head over and, yeah. and over and over and over again. And each one of them works. And um, the guy who wrote the song was told that they, that he had to write something classic, but that everyone can hum to, but that can be s- separated out into different variation so that it's not the same thing it's not you are hearing the same thing over and over again but it's in a different fashion so you don't get bored of it instead you get you get attached to it mm-hmm. and um so they put together this entire jazz orchestra which by the way rentaro played the bass that? clarinet yeah yes <laughs> it, yeah but it's, it's, in, it's in the credit yep it's in the credits so he plays the bass uh clarinet in this mm-hmm. and um the woman who sings the song in almost flawless English. Ooh, yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's just, it's just amazing. It's just, it's a really very well composed song. Yeah. And of course you know, there's other stuff into it and that fits very well, especially with the uh, ending scenes of, of, well. of the movie. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. And I, I, I just love the fact that they use this sort of, jazz soundtrack for it because it is yeah. very 20s mm-hmm. it's very you know which a call back to that um but it also has this sense of a kind of decadence to it um and then you know they throw all that all that out the window when the ziggurat blows up and we get that ray charles piece uh, yep which a wikipedia edit- editor rather peevishly points out is not on the soundtrack she's like okay <laughs> fine uh, rights issues. It's a shame because it should have been. Yeah. Um, but uh, and and again, kind of noting how they're they're approaching this. You know, that song comes out, no sound effects, nothing else going on. It is just that song being poured into your ears uh, yep. as everything is falling apart. Uh, and I think it is just a perfect choice for that moment because it does sum up everything that's happening right then. Oof. Speaking of credits, did you notice um, one of the uh, extra voices was Go Nagai? No, I didn't yeah. see that. <laughs> no. no, I didn't. Oh, wow. So I think they, they called what? him some favors or whatever, but yeah. The Massacre what? Nagai. Was he like red, random crowd person yeah, it was, A it, or something? It was at the very bottom, you know, additional voices, and it was like, you know, five or six names in there. And there are probably other folks in there too. I just didn't notice. Um, wow! But yeah, wow. I like, I, I that's that pretty name. cool. That's 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 interesting. <laughs> um, well, uh, speaking um, Kawajiri did backgrounds on this. You're, you're checking Kawajiri, Ninja Scroll, you know, um, all that stuff. He he was one of the main like layout artists on the movie. So like they they got serious oh, talent on this. No joke. Um, one of the uh, I don't know if this was intentional or not, but in the uh, the scene when they're walking into Zone One. And the robot tells the the inspector and, and the nephew, um, "Okay, we're about to go into a dangerous place. Just you know, be mindful, whatever." And as they enter in, they they walk in front of a bar, and it says, uh, "Bebop." Yes, I noticed that. Yes, a bebop. Now, on the English dub of of this, mm. Steve Blum does the voice of the minister to the president. Is very true. So I don't, I don't know if there's any connection there, but I just thought it was kind of like one of those moments of, yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Well, and Bebop had come out what three years prior, so 
So it would have been, you know, yeah, one yeah. In, in I mean, production. It's always possible. And it was hugely yeah. successful. This is something I found out recently that I, I did not know. Like, it, it was one of the most successful, like, DVD releases of all time, uh, uh, you know, in anime. So uh, Bebop was definitely, wow. you know, a big deal. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's really interesting. Um, I, I, I do wonder if that was a, a little thing. And, I mean, that, that is a movie where I think you could, you could go back and spend a couple of hours just freeze framing to look at all the little details in the background oh, to see what yeah. they must have put in there. Well, in any given point in the in the lower levels, there are various signs oh, that are all over things and posters yes. and mm-hmm. bits and pieces of stuff stuck to things. There's stuff in the in the trash when they fall through <laughs> into the right. where the radio's playing. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's stuff around in there that I was just like, uh I, I no, I don't I don't have the like <laughs> next hour to sort of look through and be like what's on that can over there what the hell is that thing totally Um, i mean so it's like there's yeah there's i'm sure there's other little easter eggs in there Mm -hmm. totally yeah um but yeah no it's it's a fascinating movie um because it is able to pull together so many things but also feel you know um uh it feels whole it doesn't feel like it's a mishmash it feels like it's very tied all the way through Despite be, having a kind of, I don't want to say an odd story, but a um, an operatic story, right? A lot of characters, a lot of things going on, bouncing around from character to character, you know, right. Star Wars screen wipes, all that stuff, um, uh, and also being a little a little fantastic in the sense of Tima having these sort of godlike powers over electronics and so forth. Yeah, um, yeah, which is cool. But... It's also. It's also you know interesting in that fashion as well that you drop in to a deep background story for all of these characters. You have no idea what their motivations are. So the exactly. only you're coming at this with pre-built characters that are doing things from their own history that you're like, huh? Okay. And that's, and that's where I think. <laughs> what are we doing? I, I, why are we doing this? <laughs> exactly. And that's why I think Otomo was key. Because you look at, you know, especially yeah. Akira Manga, and that's one of the things he does perfectly, is throw you into a, into a situation with a bunch of characters, with a bunch of backstory, and he's not going to info dump on you. You know, nope. no one's going to sit there, but you will get from dialogue, you know, well, you know, oh yeah, this this was a, a thing, you know, he thinks he's his father or whatever. Um, you know, and it, it all gets woven into the story rather, rather nicely. Um, even with, well, and speaking of, you know, the Bebop reference, you know, <laughs> They uh, they arrive in Metropolis and they go to get a uh, um, they they go to get a, a detective and they go into the Blade Runner room. Oh right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Like>. huge, <laughs> the huge like panoramic view and then they the, the big things swimming through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the air in the background. We're, we're here to. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we're here to find this guy who's harvesting organs, you know, and they're totally blown away by like the mm-hmm. what's what's going on around them. And it that's one of the things I always loved about Metropolis is that I always thought of it as the city as its own character mm-hmm. and in as part of the story in, in you know, just because it's there's so much to it and there's just so many things, you know, that's going on and you get tricked into looking at at rewatching things. There's a Little teeny tiny scene towards the end that as the city is 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 you know falling apart, things are falling apart, and I actually rewound the the movie because I thought I saw something and it really wasn't anything. And what it was is that in the lower right hand corner, a door opens, a kid looks out, and the mother comes out and grabs him, brings him in. Yeah. But it's just a flash of moment that you don't really register what that was. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait, 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 hey, hang on, hang on, go back, go back, go back, go back. <laughs> Some kid being a little dork, and his mom is just like, falling apart, get your butt in here. You know? and, but they, it, but there's like little things like that are happening, and and you know, it goes back to what you were saying about um, Otomo's writing and how you know, you just kind of you're given these snippets of information, and there's no data dump, and you, you're left to put the pieces together because when you watch some of these scenes, you kind of look at the robots and you just kind of wonder where they're from why they're doing like the 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 robot that's the clown with the with the balloons yeah. doing something and you feel bad that he gets shot up because you you have this this thing of just like 
this is his purpose. This is what he's doing. Does he not derive joy from it? Why would you do this? He seems harmless. Why? Would you? But there's all that going on, and then you wonder about, and then they go away, and you never see them again. Mm-hmm. Then the, you know, there's the, the the crowds. You know, as as the big crowd scenes. You know, like as people walking around, and even though they're little tiny oh. indes- indecipherable just dots, mm-hmm. you can tell they're doing something. Yeah, you want to go zoom in. Tell me what that. Person- <laughs> Doing, I want to know, but you never do, and that's part of like you know it's just this whole thing. And you know, Otomo just a wonderful job of just mm-hmm. putting all these disparate pieces together until finally you realize at the end there is all these connections, mm-hmm. and and even though you're you're kind of don't know exactly what they are, you know it's all happening together, right? And you know that 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 little dot at one point is being affected by. What you see, what was happening at the end, the destruction. And I mean, and that's the interesting presentation style that you get where you don't have the info dump. It's as if you literally walked in. You just walk into an average room, and there's people having a conversation. There's you don't you don't get people stopping and be like, oh hi, I'm you know such and such, and I lived here, and blah 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 blah. This is my life story. Now we're gonna continue with the conversation. So it's like, yes, it's a very organic kind of kind of experience. You drop in, and then you get snippets of like okay so you've got a bad backstory obviously and something terrible is happening to you mm-hmm. so this is going to affect you how you're going to move forward and i don't know what it is but maybe i get a little little interest you know speculating on that so, mm-hmm. we'll find out yeah there's there's nobody going sort of voce interrupting thing going by the way i'm a very bad yeah. person and i'm going to start killing a lot of people in a few yeah. moments yeah. <laughs> look forward to it <laughs> um <laughs> the one thing i will say steve that I, I think for the animated film versus the the 1927 film is the the 27 film i think gave a better feeling of the city being a thing mm. Okay. This the animated version. The city is a giant mechanical functioning city, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have the same kind of psychological and visual impact of the workers, like truly in Fritz Lang's vision, slaving away at giant dials and mm-hmm. physically having to well, manhandle how this giant beast of a city functions. Mm-hmm. And in this, it's and, like you just you have the underclass that's doing things. And you have the robots that are doing things, but there's a the other than the giant, you know, weapon, the cigarette <laughs> weapon. You don't really get that great sense of an integrated giant machine out of the animated movie that you do out of the film. The Fritz Lang version, if you notice, uh, for for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, there the machines are given. Um, you have to look for it, and and it's almost subconscious in the way that it works into your mind. But they are given human characteristics. The mm-hmm. dials create faces, and there are th- moments when you go, "Oh, it's it's the city is a body," and you look at the people and and as being part of that that body working it, and you know, the yeah. you know the regular motions like that. Whereas right. you know, go ahead. I was gonna say, and I, and I think that gets to the differences in what the movies are trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Deus Metropolis is very much about the original film is very much about you know humans being kind of subsumed as cogs in the machine rather literally, whereas the anime film is more about humans being uh, obsolete, um, and they're just you know then the machine is just you know the, the city's fine without them basically, uh, and so they're just sort of mm-hmm. laying around eating noodles and you know trying to find a job. Um, right. It's very different. And, and Jay, in the chat room, I think you make a very good point. One of the interesting things, one of the difficult things about Metropolis, I think, for a lot of audiences, is all those disparate elements. The fact that it does not look like a typical anime film. Um, you know, yeah. The fact that those robots do not look like typical you know, anime robots. That is not Violet Evergarden, right? Like, the, the, these, those are very Art Deco designed, you know, things. Um, you know, you think advanced society, you don't think you know, cogs and clockwork that, that move all of these things in and out. Um, well, Fei-Fei, or Fei, or Fei-Fei, whatever it is, it looks like a garbage can. Right. <laughs> it's like a garbage can with a, with a head. Fei-Fei, Fei-Fei you know, with weird arms. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like, that's that's not what I would think of. I would think like, you know, super sleek, kind of like crazy chrome robots, like the ones that are the street sweepers. Mm-hmm. They're much more right. Art Nouveau, Art Deco-styled, right. kind of like, they look 
cleaner versus obviously Fei-Fei is not supposed to be a clean invisible robot it's supposed to be an invisible mm-hmm. taking care of garbage but it's also very tezuka right it's very much that right. that those, yeah. those odd designs of, or those those um deliberate designs of his of being like this is going to be just kind of oddball very deliberately um and i'm trying to see if, if there was any of that in the manga which i can't really find any of sadly um but yeah. did either of you feel a a connection to Big O when they were bringing out uh, the the investigator robot. I did not think of that. Did any of you no. get that? I was thinking Blade Runner again. So there's a place. Oh yeah, well yeah, actually that yeah that that whole scene down there where there, there's no ceiling. Um, but yeah, in Big O, um, one of the characters is a robot investigator, mm-hmm. and in one of the, in one of the stories, isn't, isn't it his maid? Bring him I thought his maid was a robot. His maid is a robot, okay. but there is but there is an actual um, other Separate robots robot that thing. are okay. the robots, and they are kept in a storage much like what's in the, in the movie. Interesting. And so, so you know, obviously, I saw um, a Metropolis before I saw a Big O. So it took a took a few years, obviously, before that connection happened. But um, I was I was like very much like oh, that looks very very similar yeah. to to what happened big in Big O, huh. but. Now, now that I'm thinking of it, you actually put another thought in my head, Brent, uh, about Blade Runner, <clears throat> and I can and like my back of my head is like going, "Yes, Jealous would fit in this." Yeah, yeah. oh, this totally. Movie. Oh man, <laughs> yeah, I, I was totally doing some some you know Vangelis music Blade, and, and Blade everything. Run- uh-huh. Well, and you know, I think the, I think the sequence of the um, uh, like the circus robots being shot up is again very Blade Runner with the glass shattering and all that. Right. It's very much yeah. reminiscent of that sequence. Uh, and just in general, oh, I think yeah. some of the the like underground sequences in, in that feel very Blade Runner, very, you know, gritty. Yeah. Um, gritty, dark, no semi semi noir. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and yet this is a movie that keeps its pace. Uh, like I was rem- I was really noticing rewatching it that for how much that's yeah. going on and for how much like political stuff that's going on, it moves at a pretty rapid clip and you're always seeing something happening. Um, there is an excellent use of old um, 20s and 30s scene change. Yeah. Transitions. Right. And it just keeps it keeps it going, keeps it moving, and so you don't linger on any one scene too long. Yeah. Then it's kind of like once the action is done, it's done. You go go on to the next one. It's not that the movie is fast paced because I don't think it is, nope. but it is consistent. It is yeah. a consistent rate that just that just mm-hmm. you, and you feel comfortable with it yeah. with, with the rate that you're going at. And then you get and, moments. And again, I think. That's- okay. I was gonna say, and I think that's where Otomo comes in, where he's able to, you know, pace the script, so to speak, and you know, kind of get that. Oh, <laughs> the haunted <laughs> light. Yes, exactly. The, the light. Bum, bum, like, bum. Uh, um, well, and I wanted to, to, I wanted to bring up, you know, Otomo because I think he's a good example, or I, I, I think he is why we get scenes like the, um, the steps in snow. Um, which oh. I remember. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I didn't so, even think about so that. I remember, I remember, you know, that that is a sequence that I I remember very strongly from the film. And I remember thinking, why is that? Like, why does that film, you know, stick out at me so much? It's a lovely shot film uh, sequence and so forth. But I realized that is the first time in that movie where every single plot thread all intertwines at once. Revolution. Yeah, they all crash into each other. Everything crashes into each other. But, yeah. And they're all interacting in very logical ways. And it's amazing seeing him figure out, okay, yeah, this person would do this, and that person would do this, and this is what's going to happen, and here's how it's all going to go out from there. And it's just such a satisfying scene because it is just – it's 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 good writing. You know, it's, it's very effective writing. Right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That And, you know, the first time I saw it, when I saw, I didn't even think about that. Thank you, Brent. Um, the first time I saw Metropolis and that scene came up, I literally thought that okay, the end of the movie, the movie yeah. is come. Yeah, yeah. And, and you have a whole other quarter of the movie to go through yeah. at least. Or was it like a quarter of the third of the movie yeah. left? 
you know? And so I was like shocked. I'm like, wait, there's more? Hang on. Yeah. It didn't end? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Oh, there's more. Oh, boy. Um, did either of you notice that Dr. Loudon's uh, laboratory when it's before it's on fire? Um, <laughs> it's, the Akira, it's the Akira containment unit. Yes. Oh, I did not notice that. You're absolutely yeah. right. Ah, that's great. Yeah. Dome with giant hoses and stuff coming off it everywhere. Yeah, I, yep. I stopped the film at that point. I'm like, wait a minute. Well, and, and, <laughs> Hold on here. <laughs> well, and, and its explosions particularly are very Akira. Like, like the way it explodes oh, yeah. is all of that. Yep. The fire and smoke and such. Yep. Um, uh, that was kind of a... Uh, also that the, um, the Mardu party... So Duke Red's uh, party that, you know, he becomes the head honcho. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it made me, it, I looked up and it's like, you know, Mardu party, Marduk from yeah. Babylonian myth mm -hmm. is a living, is, what is it? It's a uh, living king of the gods, deity of justice, compassion, healing, recognition, and ma magical magic and fairness. Wow. I'm like, wow. Well, you got, yeah. wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting. Well, well, Tima is, is a, is a, um, is a, off of a Mesopotamian queen's name, okay. uh, whose name I'm forgetting right now. But yeah, yeah. So just, I, I, I thought that was very interesting because it's like, okay, so this goes more towards the, again, the sort of the ambiguity. Who is bad and who is good? Mm -hmm. You know, is the Mardu party yeah. absolutely bad, or are they instilling justice? Mm -hmm. You know, are they bringing a their sense of fairness? So it's not yeah. there's not an objective goodness or badness. It's completely subjective that they are you know fully inhabiting their belief as as is indicated by him and his you know mm -hmm. trying to get Tima to sit on the god seat. Yep. You know he has a completely confirmed sense of what his justice and fairness will be mm -hmm. in achieving this end. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, that's frightening as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think, um, and one of the things that always does so well with the Duke red characters in these stories, um, Duke red being, so, so for those not familiar, that's had this thing called the star system, wherein he would reuse character designs in different right. stories for similar characters, right? So if he needed a, an imposing... Yeah. His nose and hair is like, you just see that right. like, again and again. I'm like, I know this guy. Why do I know him? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was really fun when Rock showed up in Astro Boy 2003. I was like, ah. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> nice. Uh, anyways, um, um, is that he is this very self-confident leader with these strong ideals and strong beliefs. Um, and he's not presented as the ultimate evil. Like he, he's presented as somebody who may have taken a wrong turn. You may, maybe is too extreme, but you know his view of the future is, when you think about it, to create an artificial life form, to, um, to manage the unmanageable. Right. What you clearly see in Metropolis is that this is a society that doesn't make sense to people. That that isn't working for people. Yeah. And so he's like, I'm going to create, you know, this, this this ideal form that can then be plugged in and figure out how to do everything and want everything for us. Um, and it's like, he's not the only one with that idea. <laughs> no. Yep. Oh. Um, and inside the Lego room of doom. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I did find yeah. it very interesting, though, that that the uncle and uh, they're like, it's like a tin tin. Oh yeah, totally. You know what I mean? It's just like, wow, this harkens back to like a time when those character designs, the round face, the, the kind of little just, funky chubby yeah. walking kind of style <laughs> where it's like, wow, some of your characters are a much more fluid looking and then you've got some of these in a kind of like little chubby guy kind of format. <laughs> it's like these are interesting choices. Well, it's it, and and it's one of the things like I um uh Shinsaku Ban, I think is the name of the detective uh, uh, the uncle, um, the uncle, and he again is one of these characters who shows up, up over and over again. And it is usually his fate to be the investigator who gets beat up, right? He's the one who goes in, finds out what's going right. on, gets captured, beat up, so forth and so on. Which is why I think the scene where he rescues Tima from um, uh, Rock 
Rock. Uh, on the pool yeah. table. Yeah. Which, creepy scene, by the way. Um, mm. ooh, oh, very that, creepy. That laser. Um, Just getting a little into it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very much so. Uh, uh, is that sort of sense of redemption for Shinsaku Ban, that he's constantly getting beat up, constantly, you know, getting the short end of the stick, and he shuts that door... And just bam, 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 takes out Rock, no questions asked, done. Uh, and then just says a you know, little, mm, you know, <laughs> yeah. classic hero moment. But one of those things that I think, right. you know, if you're not familiar with Tezuka's character, it's a cool moment. But I think folks who have been you know, reading Tezuka since they were four years old, they see that and go, yay, he finally gets his moment, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> For once. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, and speaking of creepy, creepy scenes, one of the things that, oddly, it really impressed me about this movie is that it refused to sexualize any of the female characters. Yeah. Right? Like, you don't see Tima in some weird outfit. She comes out of the thing nude, but she is glowing so incredibly brightly. She's basically right. this, this blurry spot. Um, she immediately gets the, the, these things See, on. I, yeah. But from Duke, Duke Red, that. you do get the creeper pedo feel, though, oh, yeah. with his fawning over her. And it's kind of like, <laughs> okay, she, Tima's not presented in a style like that, but it is like, you know, let's bring her some cute girl oh. outfits and put her in the in the hotel where she writes Kenichi in a very obsessive <laughs> way on the wall. Red rum, red rum, yeah. red rum. Yeah, she's having a data loop problem right there. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but you know what I mean? He, well, I, it's not like he does anything super creepy but it's like there's such an inference there of like mm. he's just gonna hang over her shoulder and be like yeah yeah <laughs> like uh, no no uh, so so two things i read and you know the the uh, brent you know the manga because i don't it wasn't there the team character was derived from the girl character in the manga um, and she very, very she's much. a more of an adult she's an adult version um, Somewhere I was reading uh, reading that. Okay, I don't know if that's right or not. Yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, that just came up in something that I read. Mm -hmm. But the second thing uh, about the about the whole creepiness of Tima and the father and the the Red Duke is um, you never learn. Do we ever actually learn how she died? The, the daughter. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't. I, no, we never do. It, do we so we don't know anything so his plan could not go into effect unless she was dead so how did she die mm. was it an accident did the accident spur him into this action did he have something to do with that accident and, but isn't that I mean, the whole kind of the thing or like yeah, you walk yeah. in on this and you don't you have no yeah, idea no, because yeah. you're not gonna get that info dump yeah or it's just like you have yeah. to you were left with that now after the after the experience to sit and ponder isn't isn't that wonderful they left you a gift and let's be honest <laughs> it's astro boy you know yeah. it, it, it's dr ted ma and astro yeah. boy, and i'm gonna create a you know, robotic version of my child yeah. um oh. which is a and Astro Boy treated it as a very creepy thing. <laughs> it's a deeply uh -huh. unhealthy thing for him to do. Um, so, so the scientist who created Tima, mm -hmm. did either of you get a Ultraman feel? An Ultraman. Um, it's a cartoon character. Um, God damn it. <laughs> I, I hate when this happens. Um, you got a wacky, crazy scientist kind of, you know, yeah. It's a video. Like it's a that, video was, that was about it. It's Dr. a video. Wiley? Mega Man. Mega Man. Dr. Mega Wiley? Man. Yeah. Did, did you get any Dr. Yeah, Wiley vibe? There was a bit oh, of a Dr. Wiley vibe to him, I think. Yeah. Okay. I can see that. Yeah. Having not played Mega Man, I really that doesn't say anything to me. Is the, is that the not to do with the round glasses and the weird little mustache and beard thing? That's a totally that's Sonic the Hedgehog, isn't it? I think so. I think you're thinking Sonic. Yeah. Okay, yeah. and that's the only Mega, that's Mega, the only one I'm thinking of. Sorry, the Mega Man just just for those out there is a whole separate universe thing, fanfic theory. There's a great band oh, that boy. does music solely based on this, and it's just its own genre. It's just, it's its own thing. <laughs> it's just it's people get sucked into it, and it's 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 really kind of weird. It's it's like. It's like you know, people get sucked into Sonic Hedgehog, and there was a cartoon, and there was all these things about it. 
multiply that by a thousand, and that's Mega Man for some of these fans. Mm. They're just really it's it's that world. Mm. Anyway, um, Jay said Doctor Light. I don't know. That might be from Mega Man. I'm not, it could be. Me, yeah. Yeah. Could be. Um, yeah, I'm not up in my my Mega Man lore to be honest. Yeah, neither am I. Um, <laughs> At all, but, but, remotely. I know. I know what the word means. Well, and, <laughs> you know, when, you, when you make a movie that is this um, retro, you know, it does invite those comparisons. Yeah. A lot of the designs yeah. look. I mean, they look, frankly, kind of you know early Disney, you know Popeye, uh, uh, yeah. style sometimes yeah. too. Um, which of course was Tetsuka. By the way, if uh, by the way, last last mention of Mega Man. Proto Men is the name of the band, so they do really good music, but it's all based on Mega Man. So if you guys want to check them out, check them out. Okay. Um, now, did you guys get out of this the existential question of who am I? A little bit, a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, no. This is <laughs> slightly. <laughs> it's so a little bit, a hint, yeah. honestly. Yeah, was, especially just you know Tima's Tima's conception of I'm a human, right? Mm. <laughs> like. Wow. Okay. Yeah. What does it mean to be a human? What, what What do you mean by that, Tima? Do you feel like right. a human? Are you thinking like a human? I mean, can you define your terms for me? Right. Well, and you know, she's born, <laughs> and, and again, it's good writing. Uh, you know, she's born in a situation where nobody told her she was a robot. She has all the qualities of a human, and they like they, you know, explicitly point out that she, you know, she has, uh, you know, a heart and a liver and all. Like she has versions of all the human uh, body parts mm -hmm. um so there's no reason she wouldn't think she was human right like she has right. all all that um uh and again it's, it's why i think that is so well motivated that when she when she flips when she does kind of the the face heel turn she um it's because she realizes oh wait no like i am i am a tool you know i'm yeah. i'm one of those yeah. um you know crap <laughs> yeah uh, time time to go insane mm. awesome <laughs> well i just i thought, I thought it was interesting that that moment of recognition is again so many blade runner mm. elements in there where i'm like yeah. replicant wow do you know if you're a person yeah. or a replicant yeah. like oh mm -hmm. um well you know you, you can go a lot of ways with that right like um um how do we know kenichi isn't one uncle does not seem particularly concerned that Kenichi just goes off missing in the city and there's <laughs> all manner of hell breaking loose. For it seems thirds, almost man. yeah, I mean and that would be a okay. he's tougher than you think. Which yes. if he was a reinforced <laughs> tough little Astro Boy robot kid, yes. <laughs> yep. And arguably if like parts of him got blown off, you'd go to the local electronics store and get new stuff. Well, you know, so it's like I thought about that for a moment or two. I'm like Yeah. Well, and, you know, that ending, which I think is arguably the, maybe the weakest isn't the, the best term, but the, the ending is very ambiguous and very just kind of, you know, we, it just kind of stops, kind of. Yeah. Um, but if read through that lens where Kenichi is going back to live in the land of the robots and, you know, his uncle just kind of smiles, it's like, huh, that, that, that fits kind of nicely. Yeah, because you know, if I took my if I took my niece here in Baltimore and there was a riot and she was on the other side of the inner harbor waving at me and I said, "Okay, you're doing okay," her mother would not be too pleased with you. Would be a dead man. I do not think. <laughs> I, uh, considering that mother is U.S. Army, yes, I would. Be yeah. Dead. So, <laughs> and I, that the scene where Kenichi and Tima are you know grasped hands and you know great height. I I literally wanted to shed a tear. Mm. And I couldn't. I just mm. I I I don't know what it yeah. was in in almost any other, you know, context I would have been like, "Oh, yeah. I feel moved." And yet I and, and I don't know. What, I don't know why I wasn't. I I completely agree. And I think the reason is they really drag out that scene. Yeah. Let's um, fall from here to there to here to there. <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> yeah, I, I, I get think... on, get on with the pathos. I need something now. <laughs> At one point, you're just like, just throwing the Wilhelm scream and just <laughs> the scene. something, yeah. something, anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, but it was, I mean, it was noticeable. 
Yeah. Like, I, I, it, I was kind of rather not confused, but curious that that I would have thought that that was the emo- appropriate emotion for that experience to be like, oh my goodness, I'm so sad. I feel a sense of loss, and I, I feel really engaged and, and emotionally invested in this. And yet, I got there, and I'm like, well. It's, what time is it? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that that is one of the problems is that because the, the situation is left unresolved because you don't know where it's going. Tima is still in this sort of um, Schrodinger's box state. We are like, well, I'm expecting her to be good, but she's evil right now. So I'm just kind of right. waiting for her to, to, to shift or for something to happen here. And we just get like, I don't know, it feels like two and a half minutes of just her kind of being evil and kicking Kenichi around. And it's kind of like, I'm I, okay, we can, we can move on now. We can, we can, you know, go where we, we want to go. And on the other hand, I, I will give credit for the fact that like, you know, Tima does come back too late. And I do love the fact that, you know, you get that sequence and Kenichi is just there for her. Right. And he is, he's going to be there as long as, as, as he wants to. And, and I think in any other movie, he would have hauled her up, but no. Yeah. Um, but her voice does come back through the cracked red radio. It does. Yep. Mm-hmm. But asking, what am I? Um, which is why, I mean, you know, Tima is the city, right? Like she is the, yeah, the, the indication yeah. she's turning into the city. And well, I, I, when I, the uncle hooks her up to the system, mm-hmm. it's like that kind of made me wonder when you hear her in the radio, yeah. whether her time in the God seat imparted mm-hmm. part of her to it mm-hmm. or was dialing her in. Did that sort of start the connection process? Yeah. And that the God seat just accelerated that so that physically she's not, it, you know, sort of the, the shell part of it is broken and that doesn't matter. She exists out there in the ether mm-hmm. in the city. I mean, right. it's spoiler alert. Um, it's very lame. Right, like it's very much those those things going on there, um, and, and I I will appreciate the fact that, that when the robots do come, to, like they have gathered up what are clearly pieces of her. I was really right. worried it was going to be like, well, we can't find her body, right? Like, <laughs> no, like, like right. she was smashed to smithereens. There's no question. Um, so, but you know, they have the technology; they can rebuild her. Rebuild her. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Wagner. That'll be her new name. There we are. Lindsay Wagner. <laughs> uh, oh, so, no. so, yeah, remarkable film. Anything else you guys wanted to uh, bring up? To think that it was almost not made. Mm. Yeah. I, that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, we were talking about it earlier. Yeah. Uh, Tezuka initially said no. Rintaro went up to him and said, hey, you know, uh, during a pitch meeting and Said, hey, why don't we do one of your old mangas? Let's do Metropolis. No. Next. <laughs> they had to wait until Suzuka was dead. Yep. Uh, before they did it. You know, and it was all just um what was it? It was a um after a TV uh, interview that Otomo and Rintaro actually talked together about it, I think. Oh, okay. Cool. And 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 then it just snowballed from there. And apparently they spent this is going to sound weird. Three days in the mountains together, just the two of them, Rotaro and Otomo, oh, writing the script that, yeah. for for the for the movie, and it took them at an onset years. where there were many delicious moments of misunderstandings and hijinks. Thanks. <laughs> 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 but um, it took them like three years, and you know, with with the CGI and all that, and and putting it together, and 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 but just to think that you know they had to wait until. Unfortunately, he died. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and in fairness, again, I you know looking back at the original work, I can see why, right? Like it is this yeah. one volume thing he he put together that was a fun little adventure romp, and I'm sure if I was Tezuka and somebody said, "Let's do this," I think no, like that was a a weird little offshoot thing I did. That's nah, nah, nah. Um, but yeah, these I paid guys, the I paid the electric bill and I had a couple of drinks with that. I don't yeah, know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that was Tuesday's rent money. Or, 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 yeah, right, February's money. Exactly. <laughs> um, exactly. I did some things I'm not proud of, but you know, it got me through. Well, it's like um, Sherlock, the BBC Sherlock series, exists 
because Stephen Moffat and the guy who plays right. uh, his, the, the, other, the other writer um, took the train together every day. And they were huge Sherlock Holmes fans. And every day they would just talk about how awesome it would be to do a modern Sherlock series. And they just spent months and months and months hashing this out as purely just a fan idea. Um, and then at one point, Dr. Uh, Stephen Moffat said, hey, I'm the showrunner for Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> I, I have clout. Um, and, uh, and, and they, they you know, talked it over and it happened. But that was simply because those two guys you know, worked through every single little detail of that before they even got to the pitch meeting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think it's why some like, the, some like Metropolis here works because two people who knew what they were doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> much worked on this. Yeah. Um, now, I would say from for this animated film, mm. it probably would have been better if I had not seen the Fritz Lang film. Interesting. Why is that? I because the the analysis of the Fritz Lang film and the time period in which it occurred made it such a seminal work of film mm-hmm. that it you know what I mean it's mm, it's had such ripples through film filmography since it mm-hmm. it came into being and the society in which it arose and the commentary about you know political and, and economic circumstances and the development of you know post world war 1 pre world war 2 mm. in germany and the world in general uh, obviously mm. um, it it's just kind of hard to sort of down gear into metropolis gotcha. the anime mm-hmm. to be like okay there's a different set of sort of niceties that are going on in the animated film Mm-hmm. that still are you know touching on those issues but it's not this isn't a great commentary on things this is a commentary on it's something that's much later in time mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> so that I, i'm tr- you know trying to watch it i'm trying to i'm trying to watch it through the lens of 1927 mm-hmm. film mm-hmm. and i'm like this is just incongruous to me <laughs> i'm <laughs> trying a, i'm having a hard time <laughs> getting where that where the commentary is you know, the the marxist society and the, <laughs> the classist structure of the proletariat and the bourgeois and like ah, i'm having a hard time with this so i i think it would have been much more helpful to have not seen the 1927 film and to have seen the anime and had that as a more modern cultural context to make the connections with mm-hmm. Fair. for me that's it's one of those things where it, it's not that hard for me to, to when i look at a, an original piece of work and then i see something new that's based on it or loosely based on it however there, there's some adaptation of it for me i'm always interested in seeing how it's created differently mm. In, in different ways. So I don't, I, it's easier for me to, I guess, to be able to go, here's the Fritz Lang version, which I, I saw first before, of course, right. you know, the anime. And, and so one of the things for me as I'm watching the movie is, is the first thing is Maria. Uh, once I understood that Maria is not Maria. <laughs> yeah. And this anime, you know, literally. And then I was just like, okay, this is a totally different thing. This is going to be, so there's going to be things I'm going to need to drop mm-hmm. from Fritz Lang to move into there which is why i kind of frustrate some of my friends comic book friends when when they talk about the mcu and the and the dcu and mm-hmm. i go oh i'm fine with this that and the other thing they look at me and they're like hey, it's not canon <laughs> and i'm like hey, it's okay it's mm-hmm. okay but 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 i can see how where if 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 because as you say it was such a it, if you know anything about movies, you're gonna know Metropolis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's it. You just can't you just can't be a film buff and not know Metropolis. Even if you've never seen the movie before, you're gonna read things about Metropolis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I can understand how how like people would go. Here's what I see. Here's what I think, and this is how it moves on, which makes it even more incredible that Tezuka made something based off of a freaking poster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. To have a lighthearted adventure, Rob. <laughs> right. That's not what the movie's about. <laughs> no. There's there is adventure. <laughs> sure, the hell's not lighthearted. No. I mean, I mean, unless unless class warfare is funny. I mean, <laughs> no. 
a very odd scene. <laughs> Animals running around. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, it's hmm, it's it's weird. But uh, yeah, yes. so um, yeah, that is that is Metropolis two thousand one. Uh, it's definitely a a remarkable film. Um, one that I'm, I'm glad exists for as odd as it is. Definitely. <laughs>